Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So we were looking at the G equation which is written back here again. Uh, this is typically uh, belonging to a class of uh, what is called as Hamilton Jacobi equations. Well not exactly this but we will we'll look at a specific form of this pretty soon which could be looked at as a Hamilton Jacobi equation but the reason why I am mentioning this is yesterday we were talking about uh, the possibility of solving the G equation as if it is a scalar field everywhere in the domain with the G varying from a, a value that is less than 0 um, to a value that is greater than 0 through a very thin region where it, direct, it, where it drastically increases. Um, from minus 0 to plus 0 uh, sorry less than 0 to greater than 0 through 0 and wherever you have this iso surface of g equals 0 will form the um, uh, flame flame sheet is what we were saying. But it is possible also to solve this equation uh, directly without having to actually assume that is a scalar field. Uh, so you do not have to actually solve for this everywhere in the flow field it is possible for you to solve for this directly. And uh, the only problem there is uh, you will find that you require uh, uh, you, you, you have to make sure that you are not creating any spurious numerical oscillations if you are trying to solve this numerically because you are looking at something like a very thin sheet and it is very difficult to resolve this therefore uh, uh, typically numerical solutions will have errors that accrue and try to uh, cause oscillations. So there are these what is called as essentially non uh, oscillating solutions um, that are uh, uh, so schemes that are imp employed like typically the more advanced versions are like weighted essentially non oscillatory uh, schemes and also for the time marching in an unsteady case you should uh, look at uh, something like uh, total variation diminishing schemes and so on. So there are some special ways by which you can solve this numerically uh, directly instead of having to think about it as a field. So having said that uh, let us now try to see if we can work with this uh, in the classroom uh, on a simple problem right. So we do not have to do heavy duty numerics and have to learn a lot of advanced schemes and so on. Um, so the simplest example for us is the Bunsen burner. So the Bunsen burner, um, Bunsen by the way is a German he was working in Heidelberg so that there is if you go to the Heidelberg town square you will find a statue of Bunsen right across Kirchhoff's um, house and uh, apparently Bunsen devised the burner for Kirchhoff to do spectroscopy with it. So uh, the Bunsen burner is, is a simple idea here you have a um, You, you have a field flow through an orifice and uh, you now allow for air to get entrained in this jet of fuel that is coming out. So you have like locally uh, sub atmospheric pressure uh, over here and then the air and fuel mix with each other over here and then issue out as a premixed mixture and uh, you now light up the flame uh, in the, in the, uh, at, at the rim and then you now have a almost like a conical flame that is established okay a conical blue flame that is established uh, for most typical fields. Uh, so this is, a, this is a premix mixture in fact uh, most of our kitchen stoves work on the same principle. So you do have a orifice um, at the bottom and you and it, it entrains the air and so on. So uh, let us now try to see if we can come up with a simple version of how this will this can be done. Um, so uh, let us just enlarge this picture right there. So this is the burner rim 
And of course what we first do is to fix your coordinate system so you can have a R Z coordinate system and you now have a flame and for simplicity well I, should, I shouldn't say this at this stage uh, let us assume that it is a axisymmetric flame that is fine uh, and then what we should actually be able to show that show is this is the conical flame and then of course it is not a perfect cone you have some uh, deviations from a cone at the tip and at the, at the base as well but uh, let us not worry about all those things at this stage. What we should be interested in is to get the shape of bulk of the flame right which is what is called the shoulder of the flame. Um, so let us let us aim to do that and uh, so we are now looking at a steady state. This is reasonable in fact many times when you now light up a Bunsen burner uh, the, the flame hardly shakes so you do not even know if there is any time dependence at all. Uh, so you have a very good steady state situation in a laminar Bunsen burner so uh, that means the unsteady term in the G equation goes to 0 right and uh, therefore if you now have the uh, steady state then G of uh, let us say x vector comma t x is the position vector just being becomes g of x vector alone which in our case has to be g of r comma z because it is axisymmetric that means it is not even depending upon the azimuthal angle theta so it depends only on r and z. So you want to keep this a bit simple um, so you do not want to actually have a g equation that is a g, g expression that is so general. So rather what we want to do is let g of r comma z be um, written as z minus zeta of r. What does that mean? We want to have g equal to 0 at the flame right. So if you now set this equal to 0 you are going to get a the flame shape as z equal to zeta of r that is what we are looking for okay. So this is a two dimensional picture a graph in which you want to have the flame shape and a, a two dimensional function in an x y plane would be like y equals f of x that is what you are used to but because it is a it is a uh, three what do you call um, cylindrical polar coordinate system we are using a z r uh, plane in which we are now going to assume the flame shape to be of the form z equals zeta of r right. So if z is equal to zeta of r at the flame then z minus zeta of r should be equal to 0 at the flame so that should be your g right. So what this essentially means is any location on the flame is measured by a vertical distance zeta along z okay. So this is z of r for a given r okay. Um, the moment you now have your uh, g written out like this then we can we can write this as grad g right. Um, so grad g is do g by do r uh, e r cap plus do g by do z e z cap and uh, this is going to be so do g by do r is going to be uh, negative d zeta by d r e r cap plus you just have z over here to they take a partial derivative with respect to so that is going to contribute to 1 times e z cap and uh, grad g therefore is simply going to be square root of 1 plus d zeta by d r the whole square right. So what we have done is to find out what this is find out what this is and we now have to look at what the v is the v we now assume is now going to be basically a u0 um, or this is okay so you can say u0 typically the subscript 0 gives you a mental picture of something like a steady state <laughs> okay. Um, I just uh, or, or you could have used u bar also but I, I, I wanted to avoid bar because you have this over over bar representing an arrow for the vector so essentially what we are saying is 
v vector is nothing but u not e z cap right okay so what happens then is you now plug in uh, these things so this 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 term so in the g equation v dot uh, grad g uh, this is of course measure that uh, uh, g, g equals 0 minus uh, is equal to SL grad g this goes to 0 and we are assuming a uniform velocity everywhere up to the flame okay we are not saying that the entire flow field is uniform. The, the flow could actually do whatever it wants beyond the flame what we care about is the V that is just upstream just upstream of the flame right. Uh, so we have to worry about how what the velocity is as you look from the flame upstream right and we now suppose this is something that we suppose now that the flow is uniform up until the flame and then let it do whatever it wants it we do not worry about the fate of the flow beyond that as far as this analysis is concerned right now. We will start worrying about it a little later but not yet so we, we should now say that V is uniform uh, so U0 is a constant of course it is strictly not a constant okay we will have to think also about the velocity profile because we have this pipe and you will have to think about like a fully developed flow or whatever it is uh, those are things for a little later not, not yet okay we will at the moment say it is just a uniform constant flow. Um, so then what happens is because you have to take a dot product of V with respect to grad G and U not, UV has only a, a Z component which is U0 all you have to do is worry about only the Z component here right. So you get a U0 times 1 equal to uh, SL times square root of uh, 1 plus d zeta over dr the whole squared. Now we assume the SL to be a constant for this particular analysis at this stage there is really no reason to expect it to vary because we are not going to worry about how the step is going to be formed at this stage we are not going to worry about what happens at the base. We are looking at pretty much like a constant slope for a bulk of the flame on the in the shoulder and we suppose that the mixture is uniformly mixed therefore there are no concentration variations anywhere and uh, the temperature is uniform upstream and so on. So lots of reasons to believe that the SL is more or less going to be a constant right uh, for a given mixture um, of a big or of a given stoichiometry pressure temperature etc. So this is this is uh, this is assumed to be a constant u0 is also a constant as I mentioned therefore we can just do the manipulation so um, you just take a square of the entire equation u0 squared equals SL squared times 1 plus d zeta over dr the whole squared uh, and uh, so this is going to give you uh, so you do open up the brackets uh, u0 squared equals SL squared plus SL squared d zeta the over dr the whole squared so from here we can now get your d zeta over dr um, as plus or minus plus or minus uh, square root of u0 squared minus sl squared divided by sl squared that is not too difficult for you to figure out. So uh, we now we have to choose between plus and minus at this stage we will do this in a moment um, so we can now integrate so what we find is that u0 is a constant sl is a constant so square root of u0 squared minus sl squared divided by sl squared is a constant right so all you have to do is integrate this so zeta equals plus or minus square root of u0 squared minus sl squared divided by sl squared times r plus a constant integration constant that means we have to supply a boundary condition. 
right. In fact um, when you now supply g is equal to z times z minus uh, zeta of zeta of r and then plug it in here with the unsteady term kept in there right. So if you now keep this uh, um, time dependent then the time dependence is now going to go to zeta of, zeta of r comma t. So you will have a partial derivative of zeta with respect to t and then you can uh, you can uh, uh, so you will have a u0 uh, times 1 all right or uh, um, yeah and uh, then you, you 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 know plug in uh, this grad so square root of 1 plus dz d by dr the whole squared that would be actually the Hamilton Jacobi equation that you can solve for zeta numerically if you want to uh, but um, what you what we, we, we got past that point and uh, we now have to in any way supply a boundary condition so that is that's what I was beginning to say. Uh, so in, in, in any case you need to have a boundary condition what I wanted to point out is this is uh, this is uh, roughly first order in space okay so this is like square root of square root of 1 plus square of the first order so it is uh, basically a first order in space equation if you now also have a time dependence in a unsteady term you may have a first order in time but uh, this is this is an equation which requires either an initial condition or a boundary condition it is not uh, uh, this, this is sort of similar to the hyperbolic class of equations where you do not necessarily have to supply everything uh, unlike in parabolic or elliptic equations therefore uh, we now choose uh, to actually supply a boundary condition here in the steady state problem because you now have uh, the variable r showing up. So the uh, boundary condition here is uh, we now say at r equals capital R right zeta equal to 0 okay that means the flame is coming and getting held firmly at the rim of the burner right now this is a bit questionable if you now look look at the base quite closely you will find that there is hardly any flame at all there is a little gap there okay uh, but we are looking at like bulk of the flame it is not as if like this is very big it, the Bunsen burner is typically very small for uh, laminar flames but when compared to the length of the flame which could be maybe a, maybe a uh, centimeter or two okay that is about this, this, this small when compared to that whatever we are talking about is still much smaller right. So we, we, we for this for, for this purpose now we ignore that, that particular part uh, but, but if you now begin to take think about that you have to worry about variable SL and so on so you get into a lot of trouble uh, at the moment do not do that. So you now say the, the flame is uh, firmly anchored at the rim so this is basically what is called as a uh, flame anchoring condition or flame attachment condition you can you can talk of this is in many ways uh, so this is like flame flame anchoring condition if you do this then what happens you see if you now plug in r equals capital r and z equal to 0 c uh, becomes the negative of this with a capital r on this side okay when you now take this there. So that simply means that zeta should be written as um, zeta should simply be written as uh, square, uh, square root of um, u naught squared minus SL squared divided by SL squared uh, times r minus r. So I did choose the positive sign in the end because um, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I guess I chose the negative sign. So if I now chose this negative sign and plug cap r equals capital R, get this c equals uh, positive uh, const, const. So this is I chose the negative sign. The reason is we want to have zero to be positive right we want to have the flame looking like that uh, above the we are not looking at we are not looking at the situation where the flame is actually inside the tube so uh, this is what we get 
And R minus R is always positive because the maximum value that small r is going to take is capital R, right? Okay. What do we get out of this? What what we what we think is uh, well two things. One, first of all, we find that zeta is linear in R. Okay, that was that was obtained from right here when we found that d zeta over d r is a constant, right? So zeta then becomes linear in R. So we first retrieve the fact that you're going to have like a, a straight line for the description of the flame, and we, we the second thing we find is zeta is actually going as something times capital R minus small r. So the slope of the straight line is negative. Okay. So you are now looking for a flame that is going like that in the uh, zero to r, zero to zero to capital R domain for the for the small r. So as, as small r goes from zero to capital R, the flame has to start from a, a peak value and, and then go to zero at the rim, right? So this, of course, with the axisymmetric assumption, you now have a volume of revolution or a surface of revolution rather. In this case, you should now get a conical flame. So this basically represents a cone. Okay. So once we understand that, then we start thinking about it more like a cone rather than uh, like in a coordinate geometry kind of thing. So many times you do coordinate geometry, you forget trigonometry. But strictly speaking, you should be able to think about uh, the, the the problem in both ways simultaneously. So let's try to do that. Um, so we note that at uh, x equal to sorry r equal to 0 at r equal to 0 that is at the center line right the flame has its highest uh, uh, location right so that is actually the height of the flame so uh, zeta equals l let us say so l is like the length of the flame length or height whichever way you want to call this uh, so length or height of the flame now of course we can try to find that here we can we can find that uh, l is equal to so you can plug in um, r equal to 0 then you can find out what the zeta is which is which is now denoted as l u not squared minus sl squared divided by sl uh, well numerator alone can be written, written as power whole power half times r okay now let's look at some trigonometry so if you now have a, a triangle with a apex angle theta and uh, what we are saying is this is l and this is r right uh, so L over R should actually be um, cot theta, cotangent theta. Um, so this implies that uh, U not squared minus SL squared, um, the whole to the half divided by SL is equal to cot theta, and uh, from here we get u not squared minus sl squared divided by sl squared equals cot squared theta um, okay couple of more steps sl squared equals sl squared cot squared theta um, so u not squared equals 1 plus cot squared theta so um, what is cot squared theta uh, sorry 1 plus cot squared theta so cot is cosine divided by sine so you get the sine up here and keep it in the denominator as well so um, sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta is 1 right so you get a 1 divided by sine squared theta right so this this, this is going to give you u naught um, so you can you can forget about the square root and don't worry about the plus or minus. Just keep it as plus because everything is positive here. So SL divided by sine theta or um, U naught sine theta equals SL. Right? That's what you're trying to get. 
Now what does this tell us? What it tells us is if you now have a um, U naught that is coming up here, what we should be looking for is its component perpendicular to the flame, right? Um, as so, so uh, if you now look at this as the component perpendicular to the flame, that is the one that is along the flame. Uh, I, I, I hope I got my oops, sorry. Right. So this is my u naught sin theta, the one that was along the flame was u naught cosine theta. So the u naught sin theta is the one that is actually trying to balance the propagation of the flame perpendicular to itself at any point with a flame speed SL. That is what this basically says, right. Now if you knew anything about Bunsen burners, this is what is going on. Okay, and whatever we have done so far is a vindication. This vindicates that. Okay, what we originally said was we wanted to come come up with a, a general flame surface G of uh, our vector comma zero, or or x vector comma zero, uh, sorry x x vector comma t, which is equal to zero, and we wanted to say that represents the flame surface. And then we now want to want to have this flame surface uh, be placed in a flow field to compete with the flow field by propagating with a flame speed um, normal to its local uh, sorry flame speed uh, in, in the direction uh, along the local normal to the surface against uh, the reactants that are flowing in. So there is like a flame flow balance that is going on with the help of Lagrangian and Eulerian. Uh, conversions and all that stuff that we did, we came up with an equation. Okay, if that wasn't convincing, you now try to apply this to a simple case of a steady Bunsen flame, right? And then do all the mathematics, and then finally come to the moment of truth that we are familiar with, which is the component of the uh, flow locally normal to the flame has to balance the flame speed, right? So this is basically what the G equation uh, gives you when you are trying to do the uh, G equation uh, Bunsen burner. So from here we can actually get your L so, so L then is essentially R cot theta so that, that comes from here and you can you can easily see what theta is theta is now defined so theta is nothing but um, sin inverse SL over U naught. So when you now say sin inverse SL over U naught then SL is supposed to be less than U naught okay. If SL is less is less than U naught, then the flame. So essentially, what it means is, the flame is trying to eat into the reactants, and the flow is trying to blow it away. Okay, so it's sort of like the flame cannot propagate just as fast as the flow. So the flame sort of like tries to give way to the flow as much as it as the flow wants but it starts eating into the reactants that are coming as fast from the side. So it kind of like instead of actually trying to propagate exactly this way it now says okay you want to go fast let me give you way. But then as it goes it sits on the side and then starts eating into this and survives right. Why does it turn like that because it is anchored at the base right. So the flame is not going any way going, going any far it is just trying to give way to the flow. Uh, or, or so, so, so it seems but it is eating from the side eating the reactants from the side because it knows that it is actually anchored at the base right. So this is a condition where clearly the flame speed is less than the flow speed that is one you are going to get a flame that is inclined otherwise it is going to progressively try to become flatter so that it is normal is in the direction of the velocity. So that you do not have to worry about a component of the velocity the actual velocity itself will 
suffice. Then the catch is what is happening at the base because the base is where it is actually being held and from there you can now uh, get this flame to tilt. So that means there is this dynamics so long as the flame is anchored the dynamics is always between SL and U0 that dictates the orientation of the flame or the shape of the flame so you can call this in the several, several ways shape of the flame you can say is conical but what we refer to is, is the angle what is the length of the flame how tall is the cone and so on. So lower the SL when compared to U0 taller the cone all right. So this takes us to what we were doing the other day with trying to tinker with SL no if you now say well I am going to send an air which is a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen and you have a certain uh, flame angle. Now what if I actually progressively remove the nitrogen and then send an organ right. So if the SL now begins to increase then the flame is going to become shorter and then if I now progressively withdraw my um, organ and send in nitrogen sorry helium right the SL is going to still get it get higher and therefore the flame is going to get still uh, shorter and so on. So there is a point when the flame speed could exceed the flow speed. So one of the easier easiest ways of doing that is to try to shut down the flow without putting off the flame right. So typically uh, new graduate students who do not really care about safety uh, they, they would just try, try to shut down the air first before shutting down, shutting down the fuel all right then what happens you might have been working in fuel lean you shut down the air first you are actually progressing towards stoichiometric right. So if you now progress towards stoichiometric the flame speed is increasing and the flow speed is decreasing because you are shutting down the air. So this is a very very good combination for what is called as a flashback to happen that means the SL increases the U0 decreases the flame begins, becomes progressively shorter and becomes normal to the flow and then it can begin to propagate inside and that is a bit dangerous right. So if you now have allow for the flame to propagate inside it can go all the way up to the point where the premixing happens in the case of uh, a Bunsen uh, burner it is not very very serious because the premixing is happening just upstream a little bit and it cannot go beyond that but the flame can actually get attached here as a diffusion flame and so on okay if it can but this is actually a fairly high velocity. But in typical experimental apparatus you are trying to mix with in, in a controlled manner because you want to meter your air as well as um, oxygen as well as fuel. So you cannot just let air entrain from atmosphere in an uncontrolled fashion so you do all these things and then you have like a mixing chamber in which this mixes and so on so if the flame goes back to the mixing chamber in a confined region it can lead to your detonation right and uh, typically grad students blow up a couple of mixing chambers before they start doing their experiments <laughs> properly but it is very dangerous. So it is very premix flames are uh, uh, somewhat unsafe to deal with you have to be very careful because of this reason. On the other hand if you now had a flame uh, which was already fairly elongated and you now do things that will actually decrease the SL further and further right or increase the U0 further and further right it progressively becomes steeper and steeper and at some point it blows off. So on the one hand we talk about a flashback and the other one other, on the other hand you talk about a blow off in both these cases the anchoring is lost okay. So so long as the flame can get anchored it will now try to adjust its angle in such a way that the flow uh, balance the, the, the flame balances the normal component of the flow all right. So this is what is going on now this is a very simple idea so for example if you now think about something like a ramjet combustor or a afterburner combustor all right. So what do you what do you expect you know the typically the combustor is like you now have a uh, a fuel injection manifold ring which is essentially a circular circular tube of circular cross section right so, so you have like a circular tube which is now coiled like a uh, circle and then it has holes to inject fuel and this is typically liquid fuel 
but it vaporizes within within some distance and that you have what is called as a V gutter. So the V gutter is again like a ring but if its cross section is a V and uh, the flame is actually stabilized or uh, anchored at the edges of this V and it is now going to actually begin to look like that I am of course drawing it in a wiggle uh, for two reasons one is to tell uh, tell the flame uh, uh, from distinguish the flame from the rest of the drawing and the other thing is it is actually a turbulent flame okay. So here what is going on is the flame is trying to propagate normal to itself and uh, the flow is coming very fast. So these velocities that we are talking about are of the order of 100 meters per second or so right. So you are having a fairly high speed flow and the flame is quite turbulent as well. So in these cases you cannot use a SL for the flame speed you have to use a ST ah that is that sounds very simple although all you have to do is change the letter of the alphabet for to get from laminar to turbulent huh <laughs> well it is not so easy but it is not very difficult either okay. So for as, as a quick rule of thumb uh, for, for you to estimate what the combustor length should be if you are now trying to design a combustor based on this uh, you see all you have to do is look at a turbulent flame speed as a factor of uh, sorry I should not say factor as a multiple of uh, the laminar flame speed. So what happens when you have a turbulent flame speed the turbulent flame speed is a lot faster when compared to a laminar flame speed I am not going to go in, into details about how this happens but uh, effectively you can it is essentially an order of magnitude more for faster okay it is not as fast as detonations detonations are about three orders for three to four orders magnitude faster right we are still talking about deflagrations right and uh, this is about an order of magnitude faster than a laminar flame. So if you are now going to use like a rule of thumb on how to get your ST or like use an order of magnitude appropriately for the for the turbulent flame speed then you can simply use this kind of approach and try to get a length estimate on where the flame is going to hit the wall right or where the flame is going to uh, uh, merge from, from, from these two points near the center line either of these could be longer right depending upon whichever is longer you need to have a combustion chamber that is that, that much longer or more than that okay and then throw in a factor of safety to make it longer. You will typically find if you go, uh, go around afterburners or, or ramjets the combustor is just a long pipe beyond, beyond the uh, with the fuel injection manifold and the V gutter just to give room for this right and how did you arrive at the length exactly the same as what you would do with the Bunsen burner is not that kind of funny <laughs> right. So the same idea essentially works in, in, in these cases so bottom line the flame tries to propagate uh, against the against the flow. So we can do a little bit more on uh, uh, on the flame speed now because what we have to further think about is question this 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 approximation or the assumption is SL really a constant okay. So why would you want to worry about that because we find that many times the flame is not exactly like like this you do not get a sharp tip over there and yesterday we pointed out that we do not really have a so we, we, we assume that the flame shape is smooth right and it does not really have any uh, kinks and so on. Uh, so indeed you will find that at the tip you have like a curvature okay and under and, and many conditions I will I'll discuss conditions when there are exceptions okay but under many conditions we have to actually think about why you have a little curvature at the, at the tip very very much near the tip okay later on we will talk about diffusion flames which are much smoother. Uh, if you want to think about uh, that in your mind right now you have to think about a candle flame okay. The candle flame is not really as sharp as a premix flame cone of course it may the, the it is made sharper uh, in a gravitational field because of buoyancy effects that, that cause the flame to uh, shape itself that way but it is not because of because of the convection diffusion reaction processes right. The convection diffusion reaction processes that we have uh, encountered so far gives rise to a fairly sharp 
cone except near the tip for the for the flame uh, for the for the uh, premix flame under most conditions and then we ask the question if it is going to be locally like that if I now zoom in and see the flame is actually coming like that and then becoming like this it is flat at the top right if it is flat at the top that means it is propagating against the flow right that means the flame speed should have somehow increased over there to match the flow speed is that right is it what is going on or is the flow speed really that uniform is it possible that the flow would have actually slowed down because of the flame right. So how does the flow know that it is actually approaching a flame so that it can change its velocity and how if that is the case. So on the one hand we have to worry about the flame on the other hand we have to worry about the flow is it possible that the flame would have changed its uh, flame speed is it possible that the flow would have changed its flow speed locally there right. So in, a, in effect what we should worry about is two contributions two contributions to what is called as a flame stretch what is going on there is that the flame is actually getting stretched effectively when you are thinking about a increased flame speed over there your thickness of the flame is actually decreasing. So if you if you had a let us say think about a thickness so if you had a thick flame as you now go towards the end you have to actually thin thin it so for example in a in a PhD qualifying exams question or something if you are asked about thickness of the flame make sure that you are not drawing it uniformly thick near the tip as in uh, along the shoulders that is that is pretty important that is what they are looking for, for for you to appreciate right. So the flame stretch effect has two contributions one is what is called as the flame curvature and the other one is called flow divergence. The flame is curved all right and therefore is an, there is an effect of the flame curvature on the flame speed and then there is a flow divergence that, uh, that, that is caused by the flame, flame curvature that also slows down the flow against the flame speed right. Now there is a very very interesting point that I would like to make what is meant by flame speed okay flame speed is that flow speed for which the flame is stationary alright. So how, how would I measure my flame speed like the way we were at least beginning to think about flame speed right in the beginning was you now try to actually have a flame fixed coordinate system and then allow for the flow to come come in come in here right. So we now said whatever is the flow velocity that is approaching the flame should be the flame speed because if this were still the flame would propagate at that, at that rate. Now we have to seriously think about this what happens is if you now have a flame that is not exactly flat we have been thinking about a flat flame all the time right. So if you now think about a flame that is somewhat curved okay to just to just do not worry about why we are thinking like that at the moment the suppose that it is somewhat curved and maybe because of this and we will explain this soon maybe because of this as the flow comes in it tries to now get diverged or converge or something of that sort but all that stuff is happening locally near the flame right and because of this what the actual flame sees is a different flow than far upstream but just like how we said the entire flame thickness consists of a preheat zone and a reaction zone for the flame thickness and anything for the flow is upstream of that okay anything anything for the reactants that we consider like the flow flow velocity and so on is all upstream of that this is the flame on the whole with the preheat zone and so on here what we have to think about is okay you had curvature and all those things and the flow changed its local velocity here and so on because of which it will look like the flame can propagate against a slower velocity but still for an experimental point of view I would measure the flow speed here you see so if it is possible for me to actually handle a higher flow with a curved flame so that locally the flow slowed down 
to, ac to accommodate the flame it will look for me apparently that the flame speed is higher because it could handle a higher flow right in fact in some sense this is exactly what is happening in wrinkled turbulent flames if the flame can actually get so wrinkled at a very high flow rate right and then stay there very very wrinkled I now begin to say that is a turbulent flame and its flame speed is much faster but locally it is it is probably trying to have a flow that is much slower when it is trying to eat into it there because of it, it changed the flow. Therefore the effect of the flame on the flow basically comes back at it as a change in the flame speed because of the way we think about and measure flame speed because this is relative to the far upstream velocity not what happens in the vicinity of the flame right so effectively these two effects are actually going to change the flame speed that is what we are looking for right so if it is possible for us to think about a modified flame speed uh, that, that, that takes into account these two effects then we now can go back and say well let me put that SL here and still work with a constant velocity because far upstream the velocity is constant you see so I do not have to worry about the details what is the point in working with SL we did not have to worry about the details of preheat zone and diffuse uh, reaction zone and all those things in these lines it is all there inside it is all like a package right we are now trying to further package everything that the flow goes through right into the flame speed so that we can now use a modified flame speed against a uniform flow right. So, what you are essentially talking about here is if you now think about a, a curved flame for some reason let us say it is a, it's a perturbation right and the, I, 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 I am a little bit hesitant to use the word perturbation because that gets us into stability on whether this perturbation is going to diverge or, or converge and so on we will hold on for some time not thinking about that but essentially what I am saying is let us think about like a small, slightly curved flame for some reason. I would like to talk about two things when you now have this situation one is a thermo thermo diffusive effect that is if you now for example take this part of the flame you can argue the same thing on the other part of the flame so typically what I do is uh, in the classroom I dis discuss this and I in the exam I ask you to work on that okay. So you now look at a, uh, a flame that is actually having a concave uh, curvature uh, with respect to the upstream flow right. What is happening is this is now actually heating the reactants this way the conduction is happening radially inward. So the reactants that are coming in are not just getting heated up right here right but it is also getting heated up from there you got to be a bit careful when I draw a flame like this it is assuming that the preheat zone and all those things are within this and we should be looking at only the reactants that are going locally normal to that point and then getting heated up there until then it is not supposed to get heated up. So we are actually blowing this image up to a length scale that is comparable to but maybe a bit higher than the flame thickness right and when would I really have to think about that if I have to go to a region that is so small there we are talking about a curvature which is of the order of the flame thickness alright. So under the, those circumstances we will now find that the heating is not one dimensional the heating is now multi dimensional. So you have now an increased heating that tends to increase the flame speed as we see from far upstream okay but there is another effect the reactants will have to get spread out then this is particularly critical for it the deficient reactant let us say if you are now looking at a off stoichiometric condition right say a fuel lean mixture that means the fuel is deficient right and that particularly is now going to actually spread out radially and it is going to feed the flame less with a lesser concentration than if, we, if it were to feed a straight 
flame or a flat flame right that weakens the, the flame. So what you would uh, expect is if you are now beginning to talk about like the fuel diffusion versus thermal conduction upstream so fuel diffusion downstream versus thermal conduction upstream right what comes to what comes into our minds conduction versus diffusion the Lewis number right so Lewis is like a god of combustion you cannot forget him so the Lewis number has to be has to come into picture because now we are beginning to think about what happens as a function of Lewis number okay let's stop here